Hello, and thank you for looking at this presentation entitled Drab Green, Desolate Gray, Green Tropism and the Southwest Australian Flora, or From the Green Man to the Ravensthorpe Woman. The expressions being green, going green, greening the face of education, business, banking, or industry are in common currency. Yet the literature of environmental philosophy offers slim pickings with regard to greenness as it has been used, not only symbolically, but as a popular trope for fertility, possibility, and nature as a whole. In biology, a shaded plant that leans to the sun is, in order to photosynthesize is called phototropic. Similarly, green tropism is the tendency or leaning in popular discourse towards green speak, including symbols, metaphors, and metonyms of greenness. I found the best criticism of green coming from literary sources, the Australian poet A.D. Hope and the American writer Wallace Stegner. These are images of the botanically richest areas in the southwest of Western Australia and three sites I've been following during the course of my research. The Fitzgerald River National Park near Hopetown on the south coast. Lussier National Park near Jurian Bay. And Anstecane Damplands in southern suburbs of Perth. These sites are repositories of native plant diversity within the larger southwest region, which is an internationally significant biodiversity hotspot. Each site can be richer in plant life than many tropical ecosystems elsewhere on the globe, yet they are often not green, or at least not bearing traditional European or Anglo-American markers of lushness, fertility, or even beauty. More broadly speaking, green is a symbolically potent color. One of the densest concentrations of greenness in the world was on display at the Western Australian Museum in Perth in October of 2009. The Jade Buddha for Universal Peace is carved from a rare piece of translucent Canadian jade. The statue's radiant deep greenness is a compelling icon of virtue, piety, and purity. Associations between green and virtue are not only Buddhist in origin. In the 13th century, Pope Innocent III sanctioned the color for liturgical use for its balanced and pleasing qualities. In European art, by the end of the 13th century, the term sinopal came to stand for the vibrant green of nature in contradistinction to the rudimentary green of paints and dyes. Green is the living essence of nature. The archetype of the green man, the carving of the foliated head in medieval churches, is an historically recurring motif linking greenness to the natural world. In his exposition of archetypes and the collective unconscious, Jung gives a reading of the Russian fairy tale, King of the Forest. The conducting of the peasant into an underground world of green is the capacity of the unconscious for transformation into the vegetative world or even transmutation into the vegetative. Green's associations with fertile abundance in nature are the most contradictory, for whilst green symbolizes vegetative growth in the sense of the green man, it can also invoke decay and toxicity. The folklorist John Hutchings describes this as the irreconcilable, positive, negative nature of symbolic green. The word green is what Freud moreover pointed to as a descriptor that encompasses antithetical meanings simultaneously. Green as vegetative growth has been advanced politically and socially to encompass environmental consciousness and the eco-politics of the Green Party, the Greens, or even Greenies with ecological sympathies. On a contrary note, green conjures the American dollar as a metonym for capitalism and Western mass consumption. Green signifies positive reconstruction of abused places in the form of environmental remediation. The counterpoint is the malevolent twin of green remediation, or perhaps the partner in crime, the practice of greenwashing, in which green sheen companies deceptively advertise the environmental integrity of their products. So green is intrinsically contradictory and symbolically charged. But what does this have to do with indigenous plants? The disjunction between biodiversity and greenness 
and the correlation of dun colors to barrenness and sterility is evident in the early writings of European explorers and visitors to Western Australia. For example, Darwin, writing in 1836, comments, The general bright green color of the brushwood and other plants, viewed from a distance, seems to bespeak fertility. A single walk will, however, dispel any such illusion. Darwin went on to generally dismiss the agricultural potential of New Holland. Green figures prominently into A.D. Hope's poem, Australia, from 1938. Here he satirizes the contradictory views of plants, both as antithetical to the familiar leafy green plants of the old world and strangely intriguing symbols of Australian nationalism and intellectual freedom in their own right. The opening line, a nation of trees, drab green and desolate gray, in the field uniform of modern wars links the color green to army-issued green. The perception of color ignites militancy against the trees as impediments to the conversion of the land to pastoralism. Similarly, Stegner calls for a perception of arid landscapes in which the deficiency of greenness or specific sinopal shades of the color is not necessarily the overcoat of sterility. You have to get over the color green. You have to quit associating beauty with gardens and lawns, you have to get used to an inhuman scale, you have to understand geologic time. Stegner goes on to say, to eyes trained on universal chlorophyll, gold or brown hills may look repulsive. In the southwest region of Western Australia, Hope and Stegner's call has been responded to by writers and scientists Barbara York Maine, Alex George, and essayist George Seddon. For instance, botanist Alex George defines dialogy as the strategy of reversible change between the green and colored states of flora. Dialogy is derived from the Greek for interchange and accounts for the autumn coloration of the southwest indigenous flora. Getting over the color green in the southwest has required new language, new expanded descriptive vocabulary. This is a species of Melaleuca along uh, the highway between Perth and the north regional center of Geraldton. Barbie York, Maine recorded the ability of plants in the southwest to change their autumn coloration and revert to green with rain when she speaks of the russets and purples and burgundies of the autumn foliage in her 1967 work Between Wajal and Tor. Similarly, George Seddon refers to the highly distinctive range of colors of southwest plants from gray, gray-green, blue-green, and then translucent copper-reds. Seddon, along with Stegner in particular, argue for the unique perceptual qualities of the region, including some listed here. With regard to flora, the smallness of leaves and flowers is distinctive of the region, and this has come up in further studies of southwest wildflower tourism. In conclusion, this research points to new archetypes, starting with the green man, moving towards the Ravensthorpe woman, also known as Miss Daisy Pogon, here depicted at the Ravensthorpe Wildflower Show, the largest of its kind in the world. Her elegant, dun-colored image is not of warring against, but symbolically align aligning to the endemic flora of the southwest region. This is fertility beyond green, actual and symbolic symbiosis with the plants of one's place, a new archetype for the region, a getting over of the color green through an embracing of the colors, textures, morphologies, and other perceptual qualities of the indigenous flora in the southwest of Western Australia. Thank you for listening.